live and local. Starring Andrew McGinnis, Matthew Basgall, David Petron, Michael Turner, Jared Moss, Gabe Warwick, Brooke Burton. Live and local is not actually live, only live during shooting. Hello, welcome to Live and Local, where we are local, but not really live. I'm this week's host, Michael Turner, and our other hosts are behind the cameras helping me put on the show. Today, we're going to talk about the history of Hayes and the historical landmarks dating from the mid-1800s that still remain today. To find out about the fascinating history of Hayes, I spoke with two local historians. <laughs> Dobratz. I'm the director here at the Ellis County Historical Society. Hayes started because of Fort Hayes, the uh, military installation that's still south of town, historical Fort Hayes. They needed support systems for the soldiers. It was the 7th Cavalry and the 10th Cavalry that were stationed here. So some land developers came in. This was unpopulated territory still at the time in 1867. So the land developers came in and they started setting up a couple of buildings because they wanted Hayes to be a big town. They wanted to be responsible for that. When the Union Pacific was building the Transcontinental Railroad, they came through and decided to put Hayes right in the middle of the track, which is what made Hayes the city that it is today and left it, the, left it with staying power because they had the railroad through so they automatically had businesses and a reason for people to live there. Rome was a town that was started about the same time as Hayes was. William Webb uh, was an area land developer and he worked with Buffalo Bill Cody who was briefly in our area during his very early career and they decided to put a town up that was going to compete with Hayes. Buffalo Bill was a pretty young man when he was here, but uh, he was enterprising as could be. So he decided to build a city, and <laughs> on the same side of the creek as the fort was, which makes it much more convenient to get to. But when they realized where the dam was going to be built, to it wasn't a dam; it was a, 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 rail, a railroad crossing to the creek. It would form a dam and they realized they were in a really bad spot. So it didn't last very long. They were hoping that the railroad would come to their town and it didn't, they chose Hayes. So within about a week of Hayes being chose for, chosen for the railroad stop, the people of Rome, most of them, picked up and moved to Hayes. Not only did they move to Hayes, but they literally picked up their houses and their business buildings and they moved everything in total to Hayes and set it back up leaving Rome not a ghost town, but very um, lightly populated. Uh, it, it's just uh, a memory now. There's nothing left of uh, Rome. We had some big names in Hayes during its early years and during their early years. Wild Bill Hickok was the unofficial sheriff here for a while before they had the first election for sheriffs. He was just here for a couple of years. He tamed the town been dull ever since and uh, uh, he moved on. 
he had anticipated staying on as the elective sheriff, but instead his deputy sheriff, whose name was Pete Lanahan, his nickname was Rattlesnake Pete, he won the election, so he became the first official sheriff in Hayes. Hickok stayed around a little bit after that, and then uh, some strange circumstances. He about got killed in a bar here locally, and he decided it was time to leave. He later became a long-term sheriff, really well-known in Abilene, and did a lot of good there. Uh, George Armstrong Custer was here in his early days with the military. He was part of the 7th Cavalry. He was major when he came here and he was uh, out to fight the Indians or protect the uh, forts. The fort was built up then, but he and his wife, because she always traveled with him, decided to stay in a tent along the banks of Big Creek. Uh, the last one that I mentioned uh, in association with Rome was Buffalo Bill Cody. He's known later for his Wild West show that he put on with Native Americans and tons of horses and did the whole Wild West thing. But when he was here, he was still a buffalo hunter. And he was actually hired by the railroad to kill buffalo and provide meat for the railroad workers when they were coming through because there were so many people working on the railroad and they needed a good way to feed them. He was known everywhere. There's a statue of Buffalo Bill in, in London at the Albert Memorial. And uh, there's been many stories and many movies and books written about Buffalo Bill. The Chestnut Street District is a whole section of buildings downtown that are historical in nature because this was the original downtown area for the city. And the railroad track goes through in between 9th and 10th Streets. Now that was the old Main Street. It was lined up right along the railroad track. What is Main Street now that goes north-south used to be called Chestnut Street, hence the Chestnut Street District. And if you come and drive down here, you can see old buildings. There's uh, the George Phillip Hardware store. It's a stone building uh, just a couple blocks north of us. Our stone church on our property here at 7th and Main is also on the historic register. It was built in 1879 as a Presbyterian church and it's one of the earliest buildings down here. Yes, Justice Bissing Jr., uh, the gentleman that built the Mary Elizabeth home, he was quite a Renaissance man. He was very entrepreneurial. I don't think the man ever slept. He was part of the first wave of immigrant Volga Germans that came to Ellis County in 1876. He came with his parents and he was 14, year old, 14 years old when they came from Russia. They lived in Katerinstadt, Russia when they were there. And when they came here, they and the other families that came from Katerinstadt formed the town of Catherine that's in Ellis County. So he was there from the very beginning. And when he was 29 in 1891, he was commissioned to be the builder for the Catholic Church in Catherine in his hometown. He designed the interior and the exterior of the building and oversaw the construction. And he also designed the interior decorations, which are really intricate filigree uh, wooden creations that he created with his foot pedaled scroll saw, which we have in the museum on display. He, was, he really liked the decorative arts. For the next 10 years after 1891, he was a very, very busy man. Um, he was commissioned to then work on many other churches in the county, including in Munger, Pfeiffer, Liebenthal, Russell, and then not too long after that, the St. Joseph Church the Catholic Church in Hayes, which is on 13th Street. The original construction manager fell and broke his leg, so they hired Justice to come in and finish up. So you'll see if you go into St. Joe's that they have that filigree work on the interior just like Catherine does, because he designed it and made it. Still in that 10 years uh, was when he started building the house. He built several houses around town. He was um, 
untrained, but he was a very quality architect. He was very good at design in general. The first home he built is at the corner of Fort and 7th on the southwest corner. It's currently the Mary Elizabeth home, and that was his family home for, the, for while he lived here. He built past that. He got into building in general, and he built several other houses around town, including two that are side by side at the corner of 11th and Hall. The one that's right on Hall Street, is, it's referred to as the Rock House. And when you drive by, you'll see why. And then just to the west of it is a tiny little white house that looks kind of like a castle. He really loved the Victorian turrets on his homes, and you'll see that's a common theme. But that tiny little house was one of his also. He managed to open the Hayes Planing Mill, which is still a business over on, over on Hall Street. And by opening it, it allowed him to have a great workplace to make all of those great wooden creations. And the planing mill still processes wood products and they do carpentry. They make cabin cabinetry, they sp sell special tools, and they do design work, just like he always did, which is neat. That year, he also started the first electricity service to Hayes. In the beginning, he had between 20 and 30 customers and he would run it at night. He, would ha he had the power plant, I think it was at the planing mill, and he had this small little power plant. He would run it from sunset to midnight so that people could have extended light, electrical lights, and that was all it was for at first was electrical lights, but he brought electricity to Hayes. Then in 1901, with his partner Harvey Penny, they bought the telephone service that had been started a year prior and was not successful with the man that started it. So they bought it and expanded the telephone service. When they started giving out telephone numbers, the Bissings were number one. So their telephone number was one. And his daughters worked in the switching stations uh, the way that they used to have to run the phone system. They had a person that actually connected you to who you wanted to talk to with wires. And so his daughters worked in the telephone office. Uh, Boot Hill is the first Boot Hill Cemetery west of the Mississippi, the one here in Hayes's. It started in 1867, the same year that Hayes started, but because of course people died the first year. The reason it's called Boot Hill is because the people who were buried there were said to have died with their boots on. They were not sick, they were not old, they were active, and they probably got killed in gunfights or something similarly violent. So that's why it's called Boot Hill. There were lots of burials there, um, a lot of bad guys, There's, uh, there were stories of some prostitutes that were buried there, but not a lot of what we would consider normal folk, you know, they were mostly criminals and people who uh, kind of had shady business. So there, Mount Allen Cemetery is currently and has been at the corner of 27th and Vine, it's the old cemetery up there. And that land was donated by a man named Martin Allen, which is why it's Mount Allen. He donated that land because his 13-year-old daughter had um, died of an illness, and he didn't want her buried with all of the criminals. And he says, well, I'm not going to bury my daughter out there where all those shoot em up cowboys were buried. And so he gave the city some land for a cemetery we still use called Mount Allen. And uh, Boot Hill was sort of forgotten about for a while and then built on. And uh, when the Historical Society developed in uh, 1972, why well, they cleared it off, there was a building on it and a lot of trees, and turned it back into just a, a hill covered with buffalo grass and uh, they put a marker up there and uh, it's, uh, it, was, it was just a convenient place. It wasn't a formal cemetery. In fact, they, I had a hard time finding who was buried there. They didn't make much of a list. And uh, uh, so, you know, it was sort of like he got shot out in the street. You got to do something with the body. And so they buried him with the boots on, so they say. 
Emporia State University used to be the Kansas Normal School when it first opened, and a normal school was a teacher's training college. So Emporia State was the first teaching college in Kansas, and it's still a very well-known teaching college. They hold the National Teachers Hall of Fame. It's, it's really important in history. So in 1902, when FHSU opened, it was called the Western Branch of the Kansas Normal. So it was directly affiliated with Emporia State. But then in 1914, they, they've changed their name several times and I really don't know why, but in 1914 they changed it to the Fort Hayes, Kansas State Normal, which was still a teaching college. Then in 1923 they changed Normal so that it was teaching, so it was the Kansas Teachers College of Hayes. Then in 1931, and these aren't very far apart, these are, you know, 10-ish years, uh, they changed their name again to the Fort Hayes, Kansas State College when they started offering degree paths that were outside of teaching. And then the last name change, the most recent, is 1977 when they changed it to Fort Hayes State University. And I imagine it will stay that way for a while because it's the same naming convention as, you know, the University of Kansas and Kansas State University. So I think this one will continue to stick for a while. Wow, Hayes really is full of historical buildings and landmarks, but the most famous is the historic Fort Hayes. It was a United States Army fort from 1865 to 1889 that has been reopened since as a historical park. I went and checked out the fort for myself this weekend. Take a look. As you can see, Hayes is full of amazing historic items and buildings, and if you want to know more about the fort, stay tuned. Tammy Younger from the Fort Hayes Museum will be here to tell us even more.
Welcome back. We've shown you, shown you a lot of history so far in Hayes. Now we have the Fort Hayes site administrator, Tammy Younger, to learn more about what the fort was actually like back in the day. Thank you, Tammy, for coming on the show. You're I appreciate welcome. it. You bet. Um, so my first question for you is, uh, what brought the fort to Hayes? Um, well, the railroad actually was coming through ha Kansas, and then they started having problems with the Indians. So the, the Army started putting forts out west to protect the railroad workers while they're building that railroad and the stagecoach routes and stuff. Um, and that's pretty that's why the fort was here and they and once the indians were gone and the railroad was built they closed the they closed the fort then. okay so just just for that railroad yep, yep. okay <coughs> which made fort hayes pretty nice because the railroad had made it there so people could go back east or they could get plenty of supplies out here yeah that, that's important back yep. in those times for yep. sure um so fort hayes uh, i had read that fort hayes was originally called fort fletcher can you tell us why they changed it? Um, well, they started changing some of the names of the forts out west to honor some of the Civil War veterans that had died during the Civil War. And so um, they went ahead and changed um, Fort Fletcher's name to Fort Hayes, to for General Alexander Hayes, who never was out here. He actually died during a battle during the Civil War. But uh -huh. they, that's kind of how they started naming a lot of the forts. Okay, so. that's interesting. <clears throat> so I also read a little bit about um, Sergeant John Denny and the Buffalo Soldiers. Can you yeah. tell us a little bit about that? Well, the Buffalo Soldiers um, were there were there were just two two cavalry units and two infantry units of, of Buffalo Soldiers, and the Buffalo Soldiers are the black were the black soldiers. Mm -hmm. um, they had the Civil War was over, and so um, the slaves had been freed, and a lot of them. Um, joined the army as a way, you know, as a means to make some money and to, to travel or to get out west anyway. Yeah. Um, and they were um, very well respected by the Indians and, and actually a lot of the, the other soldiers too. Um, well, they, they didn't always get along, but um, the Buffalo soldiers seemed to be really they, strong and they stuck with the fight and they were fierce. and. Yeah, and I think that the reason they called them Buffalo Soldiers was that their hair reminded the Indians of the buffalo, kind of, the hair. Their hair mm. was kind of like the buffalo hair, I guess. That's pretty cool. Yeah. That's definitely something I didn't know. <laughs> yep. So can you tell us a little bit about the uh, famous Blue Light Lady? The Blue Light Lady, her name was is Elizabeth Polly, and she was supposed to have been married to a hospital steward at, at Fort Hayes. His name was Ephraim Polly. And um, she would help him at the, in the hospital during um, when they were when they were busy, and they had a lot of sick people there. And during the cholera epidemic, um, there was a lot of people in the hospital, and that was at the beginning of the fort's life. Um, and she uh, would help take care of the soldiers, and she was just really nice to him. Most of the nurses at the hospital would have been other soldiers would have been the nurses, um, so they kind of enjoyed having her having her there. Um, she was just a little bit kinder and gentler, and um, the soldiers kind of called her their angel of mercy. Well, she ended up getting cholera herself, and so as a last dying wish, she asked them to bury her up on, that, on Sentinel Hill, which actually Sentinel Hill is a hill that's a couple miles south of the fort, mm -hmm. and um, they used her, apparently, according to the legend, she, her and her husband would ride horses up to that hill at night to sit mm -hmm. and relax, look over the grounds. And um, she ended up getting cholera too during the cholera epidemic. And she figured she was probably gonna die because many people were dying. And she um, asked them to bury her on top of Sentinel Hill rather than in the post cemetery where mm. the other people were buried. And so they took her up there to bury her and they could not bury her right on top of the hill like she wanted to be because it was all rock and limestone. And so they moved to the side of the hill. Since then, um, people think that her spirit still roams around. There's been sightings of a woman. She wears a long blue dress and white bonnet that they believe to be her. Wow. Okay. <laughs> Me and some friends have went and searched for her, but no luck, No, not found her yet. No. It's been a while since we've had any real, you know, since anyone has had a sighting of her, I think. Wow. That's so cool. <clears throat> Um, so were there any other historical events at Fort Hayes that local people might be interested in? Um, 
historical events that maybe happened while the fort was there, you mean? Mm -hmm. Well, um, not so much, probably. Just kind of a straightforward railroad helping? Yeah, yeah, and yeah. Okay. Well, that's all right. <clears throat> so, uh, what is Fort Hayes used for now? Um, now it's a state historic site, and actually some of the land, um, when the government turned the land over to the state, they told them it had to be used for some certain things. It had to be used at, as, had to have a Kansas normal school there, a teaching college. Mm. Um, it had to have parks, and it had to have an agricultural experiment station. And so that is what all the land has been used for, the agricultural experiment station. The university is actually now on, it's actually on land that was, um, was part of the fort, actually. Okay. And the, the Kansas Normal School actually started out at Historic Fort Hayes in some of those buildings. And then it got, they moved some of the buildings over here where Fort Hayes State is today. That's news to me. Um, what would you say is your favorite part of the fort? Um, the buildings and all the stuff that, that's in them. There's just some really great, great, great artifacts mm -hmm. in them that we have. And I know the I definitely themselves. enjoyed it. Yeah, there's mm -hmm. plenty, to, plenty to see. So the fort has uh, events from time to time. I know you guys just yep. finished your Halloween event. Yep. Um, can you tell us a little bit about the upcoming event, uh, Christmas Past? Yes, Christmas Past has um, been going on for a really long time. I would say maybe 40 years or so. Um, but we, uh, it's an open house. Our buildings are open. People, the uh, local people come out, actually people from out of town too, but they come out and they can walk the grounds and we have all the sidewalks are lit up with lanterns or luminaries and then we have lots of things going on. Um, we're serving cookies, we have music in some, in a couple of the buildings and we, they make um, hot fried apples over a campfire. They serve hot apple cider over another campfire. Wow. So it's pretty, it's a neat, neat, neat local tradition. That sounds like a really do. fun time. Yeah, it is pretty neat. Well, thank you, Tammy. I really appreciate you coming out on the show. Well, that's all the time we have for you today. Tune in for next week's episode when David tells us about the Gamers Guild here in Hayes. You can catch us every week on TigerMediaNet.com or our Target Tiger Media Network YouTube channel. Eagle Communications Channel 17 or Next Tech Channel 102. For now, we'll leave you with Nathan Northrup. He will be performing the evening bugle calls they play at the Fort Hayes every night. I'm Michael Turner with Live and Local, where we're local but not actually live. See you next time.